I've been there three years, and I believe in punctuality. So when people aren't dependable, and when people show up and say, sorry, there's this thing called traffic that I got into, and it was traffic's fault that I'm late, you didn't give yourself enough time. Uh, if you look disheveled, like I look disheveled now, but inside I'm disheveled. Okay, so. But to, 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 you know, you're making an impression, you're going to a meeting, so being dependable, uh, valuing other people's time as much as your own time, or actually more than your own time, uh, is really, really important. Whether you're a band leader or whether you're having a business meeting, um, it's one of those, it's beyond foible. People do it all the time and it's become habitual. Uh, instead of just being an eccentricity, it's a pain in the butt. So try to really be on time and, and, and you won't have to make excuses. Try to find out who you're talking to. And nowadays, because back then they didn't have all the LinkedIn and Facebook stuff, so now you could really do research on somebody. And if you're sitting down with somebody, it really doesn't hurt. Oh, you missed the part about how awesome it is to be on time. Hi, Brian. <laughs> he is a great musician, this one. Um, so if you're, if you're going to be meeting with somebody on business of any level, do your homework. And you'd be amazed how good a conversation can go if it starts off with something that has nothing to do with you or why you're there. If you say, you really got a green thumb, don't you? And right away, they'll talk about gardening for five minutes, and then you'll get into your meeting. But anything you can do um, to just be a human and to just get to know them a little bit, it also shows a sign of respect. Not that you should say, I just spent an hour creeping on Facebook on the way here, you know, on the go train. I know all about you. Uh, better to just pepper your conversation. But it means, it means a lot to somebody, and it means that they'll know that, uh, that you care enough to look into that. Um, also, uh, you should think of those meetings, any meeting, as a date. Uh, I went into a meeting pitching a show at CBC, and I walked out going, that was an amazing meeting. And my manager said, no, that wasn't an amazing meeting. I said, what are you talking about? I had them laughing. They, were, they hugged me on the way out. They loved me. He goes, yeah, but they didn't talk. We don't know what they like, what they don't like. You were like a nice bright ray of sunshine in their day, and tomorrow you won't have a deal. You didn't get anything out of them. Sitting back saying, so what are you looking for? Do you think this is a fit? How do you think I can improve this idea? Ask them a little bit of advice. Ideally, you should mean it a little bit. But regardless, ask a few questions. Because if you're doing all the pitching and you're not getting any information out of them, the meeting only feels successful and nothing will actually happen. I mean, this is more about the people who sing jazz standards and just kind of sing the same songs year after year after year. If you look at someone like Alex Pangman, she does so much research on her albums. You'll only find a few songs you know, but all of the songs, the album 33 is a good example, uh, 12 songs written in 1933. Well, she didn't go out and find all the songs we already know. She found two or three of those and then dug really deep. Um, Postmodern jukebox can be a little annoying at times, but the idea is really good. Uh, take a song that isn't done in jazz uh, take, a, take a pop song, a, a TV a movie theme, something, and, and really, really make it your own. But repertoire is one of the things that can be a shortcut, especially if you pick the right tune with the right production. Your friends tell you after you've recorded, this is a really good, good thing that no, people almost never do. If you record a full album and somebody says to you, um, that one song doesn't quite, doesn't quite make it with the rest of them. Always be ready to abort your idea and go with a better idea at the last minute. It's incredible, a couple of records I've got, where there are 17 songs on a record, and they're thinking that they're doing me a favor. Uh, that record could have easily had 10 songs, uh, and not 17. And when you see how many ideas weren't realized, and they tried to do too much, and in the industry now, you are probably better off to make a five or six song uh, recording and sell it for 10 bucks, than a 17 song thing that you couldn't possibly finance and realize and make as good as you want, um, and then try to sell it for 20. Uh, nowadays, it seems like everybody wants to make their own playlist. Um, so put your, your, your effort and your thought and everything behind the one or two songs you really care about and push them a lot. And if you can make five or six songs and sell it off the stage, there's a big difference between doing that and coming to the station and going to Now Magazine and The Star and trying to get famous off your record. Anybody should make a record to sell off the stage. I, I am totally in agreement that nowadays it's a beautiful world we live in where anyone can make a record and anyone can do that. 
But when, they, when you start throwing it around, if it's just a demo, if it's not realized yet, um, I mean, I've heard this so many times, you only have one chance to make a first impression. I think people can hear promise and you have more than one chance. I mean, okay, it's a second impression, technically. But you do have more than one chance. It's just, why not do your best the first time out? So if you're making a, a I don't want to say a crappy CD, but let's just say a, 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 a CD that's not recorded uh, with all the bells and whistles, it's cool to sell off the stage, it's cool to give to your friends for Christmas, uh, whatever you want to do, but when you're going to the media and you're trying to get stuff on the radio, please just listen to what we play, compare it, see if the fidelity is, is, is at least close in the same ballpark, uh, because that can be, anyone can do this, but maybe if you're doing it at home on your garage band, it's not going to be as good as if you go somewhere and spend just a few bucks. Um, the representation is almost impossible here, because there are so few good managers, and the few that there are, I don't think they live in Toronto, and they cost a lot of money, and they don't, they don't actually, they're not looking for anybody. Uh, so what I have done in the past, and I'm not saying everyone should do this, it's worth considering, I just had this fake identity, I'll call her Melissa Bridal, because that's what I called her, um, and Melissa Bridal did all of my business while I was living in Europe, and she did all the emails, and she did all the, the texting and everything, and she could get me more money for my band than I could, because I'm just me. And if I'm ca calling somebody, they can be nice, they can say, oh, we only have this, oh, you don't even have any people around you yet, you don't have your entourage, you don't have any business. So Melissa could always up my rate. And I warn you that if I don't call this person Art Vandalay, because someone's probably seen Seinfeld, they'll know your line, uh, but make up a name if you want to have a fake agent, The problem, and make up a Hotmail, a Gmail account, whatever you want. But the problem is, get ready for the truth, because some people will write back going, no, this music's shitty, no, I'm not interested. They won't tell you that as the artist, but they might tell your fake manager that. And if you want a real manager, uh, here's the interesting thing, sometimes it can be a neighbor a relative. Sometimes it could be a kid who just came out of Harris, Trevis, any college or university music business course. Um, so many people are taught that there's no hope in this industry anymore and they'll hold up graphs and show you all these things. But I'm assuming you're here because you want to be and because you feel you have to be. You're compelled to do this music or to be involved in the music industry. And I applaud you for that. And it's not about making that million dollars and being famous tomorrow. The people that I meet here and the people that I'm looking at I don't think any of you have those, those delusions. So that's always helpful to begin with, that you can have somebody help manage you in, in a smaller capacity, but doing all the business yourself, you have to learn to let go of some of the reins and try to get a few more people on your team if possible. Um, yeah, so, uh, so our goal with, with clients is um, basically increased wealth on a year-to-year -year basis. Now, in our firm, uh, we've specialized in the cultural industry. So our, our clients typically are music, movies, nightclubs, comedy clubs, film, TV, radio, all the performing arts. And uh, we've helped sort of teach the government with regards to um, uh, deductible expenses for this special industry. If you're in music, uh, there's a few extra expenses that you can definitely claim. And we've taught the government to a degree that it's a much longer ramp-up period before you're finally making money in, in, in the business. Uh, whether you're painting paintings, or you're a songwriter, or a music act, singer-songwriter, or a little, little uh, music act, or you write plays. Uh, these are the cultural industries. And the, one, one client of mine, Amy Skye, she says she's an overnight success, 30, 30 years in the making. <laughs> because it does take a longer ramp-up period to, to, to finally be uh, turning that around and making a profit in, in, in the business of, of uh, providing talent services or being a singer-songwriter. So the government, uh, in a normal situation, the government likes to say in your tax return, uh, if you have losses year after year, uh, there's no reasonable expectation of profits and they want to disallow the losses. But in the cultural industries, and, you know, my firms help teach them, I guess, uh, much longer ramp-up period before you're making money. So uh, they'll allow losses year after year after year when, when uh, in a normal business, manufacturing something, whatever, after a few years, they, they would say, well, losses year after year, there, you're, there's no reasonable expectation of profits and they disallow the losses. You know, in a self-employed business uh, of, a, of a, a person uh, that is a singer, songwriter, or music act, typically, if you're not incorporated, you can picture the personal tax return, you typically have a day job, like a lot of people have here, 
and, and you'll have a T4 at the end of the year, and that goes on your tax return. And uh, you also have a, a, a business statement. It's called a statement of business activities, a T2125 that everyone should typically have in their personal tax return. That has income and all the different expenses. And of course, in the first number of years starting up a business like that, maybe there's losses. So the income is not as big as the expenses, so there's a loss. That goes to another part of the tax return where you have your employment income from your T4, less that loss, the business loss, it was a lower number than what you were taxed on at your day job, and it usually triggers refunds. So it's a, it's a problem when I hear quite often, when I meet somebody and they say, yeah, I have a music act, or I'm a songwriter, uh, but I'll, I'll call you when I start making money. I, I don't need an account right now. Well, that, that's sort of like the wrong attitude. You gotta capture the expenses right at the beginning, and year after year, make sure that you're reporting uh, this business. It's not a hobby. We aim to make money at some point. So they report whatever income there might be, claim the reasonable amount of expenses, and that's where I always like to say you should be using an industry-specific accountant who understands the nature of your business, the nature of the inflows, because uh, of the world of royalties and, and uh, exploiting your copyrights. Is, uh, I've got charts and graphs, crazy ways how money flows to the creators of music, especially in the digital age. So they gotta understand, the, the, you need an accountant that understands the type of expenses that you're allowed, because uh, our attitude with clients Typically, you're living and breathing your career day and night, although you might have a day job, but besides that, evenings, weekends, you're, you're living and breathing this career, and we like to say your life is a write-off, which means uh, every time you spend money, except for that small basket of personal things, uh, we want to take a deduction. And then if it's a good industry-specific account, that account would know that uh, internet, cell phone, and car, that's three examples of expenses where there's personal use. So you want to back out personal use of internet, not claim the whole thing for the year. A car, you're supposed to keep a mileage or a kilometer diary to prove the percentage in the end that you want to claim uh, it's car expenses for your business. And uh, the cell phone, you know, we'll take uh, 80% as a business expense. Quite often when we're audited, we'll, um, our clients have the attitude that, I don't like cell phones, I need this, it's a business tool. Yeah, there's some personal use to it. With that attitude, we write off a big part of the cell phone expense. Typically, uh, any good accountant should uh, make sure that they uh, talk about um, when there's extra money lying around. You've paid your bills, maybe there's a few, few dollars left around. Everybody's different. We always get the question, should I pay into my tax-free savings account? Should I do something about my RSP? Should I uh, put, put something extra against my mortgage? Should I just save for a down payment because I'm renting? Or should I save for another piece of real estate, just keep socking money away because I want to retire with rental property. So everybody's different. So a good accountant, and that's what we do, uh, it takes a, a whole approach to not just, oh, it's the end of the year, bring me your stuff, I'm going to do your tax return. A good accountant's got to you know, help the person along with their life. So we also uh, talk about wills. Is your will up to date? We send you to a lawyer if you don't have one. And it's very important to have the, the will up to date. And life insurance, there might be exposure in your life. You forgot to get mortgage insurance and something happens to your spouse, are you going to be out on the street because you can't make up two incomes? So we have a life insurance expert or two that we send to you. They're independent. And if in the end they uh, analyze your situation and uh, say there's a policy needed, you don't even pay them. They make a commission from wherever they sell that policy. So uh, a good accountant will send, sort of have that attitude to keep track of that stuff for you. Uh, you know, you can be in business a few different ways. You can just be an employee or and be paid for your services as possibly in music or film or TV. <coughs> but to be actually in business, you can be uh, self-employed, you could be in a partnership, or you could be incorporated. And it's not always the right time to be incorporated. It's uh, certain things that would happen in your life to decide, okay, maybe stop talk the account about being incorporated, and that would be, if there's too much money in the bank account, you're very successful and it's piling up, the idea might be to operate through a corporation where the corporation is a very low rate of tax. And a corporation really, if you think about it, is a temporary place to pay a low rate of tax uh, until the owner needs the money for whatever personal reasons. And then when they do need money, it's taken out by way of a dividend, which is very tax favorable. So we'll talk about corporations just for a second. Uh, the first 500,000 profit in a company, which means income, that's all the expenses equals taxable income or profit. The first 500,000 of profit every year is only taxed at 15%. I think it was 15 and a half last year, 15 this year, going to 14 and a half next year. So 
So that's a very low rate of tax. Personally, as soon as you have $35,000 on your tax return as taxable income, you're at that same 15% rate and then it just goes crazy from there. So the idea is that if you're making more money than you need to live on, maybe that's the first time you might think about uh, maybe you should be incorporating because tax deferral is tax planning. And uh, when I talk about that sole proprietorship, a partnership or a corporation, the exact same rules apply for HST and what's a deductible expense. And so uh, it, it, you shouldn't incorporate until it's the right time. Sometimes if you're a music act, it is a partnership. Sometimes it's, it's one person, it's their business, and everyone on stage, which are band members, are just hired talent. It's different ways to organize uh, exactly the, the business model. But uh, the Bottom expense line. is deductible if it's been incurred in order to earn income or try to earn income, that matching concept. So you might not have very much money coming in, but you're, you're investing in your business, you're buying business cards, you're, you're doing that kind of stuff, and you're paying for uh, demos, and you're and, 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 and recording uh, uh, a recording studio, you gotta rent that. And, and so you gotta keep track of these expenses, and they're all deductible as long as you're trying to earn income. These days, um, uh, that ties in also to, to car expenses. You gotta keep a, a kilometer diary, and it's really good if you did have a, a diary, typically electronic these days, of your schedule. And you can always tie that in if you're ever being audited, uh, you know. Um, the, um, the, the way to keep track of, uh, of the car expenses, they, they got these great apps these days. And you've got to be very detailed to, to, to even use those things because you, the idea about how to claim a car is have the um, kilometers, or the odometer reading January 1st and December 31st. Now you know how far the car went for the year. And every time you get in the car in the old days, you'd have a clipboard or something, you put the start and end odometer readings of a little business trip. And at the end of the year, you gotta add all those things up. And now you have the percentage that the car was driven for business. And that's the percentage of all the car expenses you claim, which is, you know, it might be a lease, uh, lease payment, but parking, gas, insurance, um, the, the toll highways your annual little license fee, a percentage of everything to do with the car can be written off if you uh, keep track of it that way. A uh, simple business model we like to have is you're operating with a business bank account and, and a business credit card. So that's almost like level two. Level one is just keep track of your expense, your, your income somehow in Excel schedule, pay stubs, any way you keep track of the income coming into your music business. And then uh, be a complete receipt pig and save all the receipts for every time you spend money in the line of running that business. At the end of the year, you have the info for the accountant. You sort of know how much money came in, your sales were. And you have all these receipts that you can add up, uh, sort in all the different categories. And we provide the clients with this very nice tax checklist. Um, and then they sort the receipts into the categories, fill in the checklist, and, and, and a personal tax return. There's nothing hard about these things. They're very easy. It's just a key punching job, really. Uh, the difficulty about personal tax returns is if there's missing information and you got to put the file down and, and then more info comes in and you pick the file up and you keep processing it. Um, but, uh, but that's the simple way to keep track of a small business is just keep track of the income and save receipts. The next level up would be a real business bank account, which most of our clients do have, and a credit card that they're dedicating to the business. And they live and breathe their career. You guys should be living and breathing your career through a business bank account. Uh, separate from the personal bank account, and basically everything you can earn uh, plus HST, which we'll talk about HST a little bit, but everything you earn plus HST would go into that bank account, pay everything with check, credit card, debit card I say, but I don't like debit cards, it's yanked from your account instantly, you don't uh, get any air miles or rewards, so uh, you pay for these check, credit card, or online on the internet because people are e-transferring everywhere. Just print out a receipt so you can prove where that money went. HST is very important. HST system. Now, HST uh, used to be uh, the, just the GST 5% and the 8% PST was a sunk cost. And what the government, and you get back in the system, that I'm going to describe, you used to get back the 5%. These days now, and a number of years ago, they harmonized the 5% GST and the 8% PST, and now it's 13%, and you get the whole thing back, and here's how. Uh, in any kind of a music, uh, business, uh, under 30,000 of sales, whether it's a corporation, a partnership, or a self-employed business, these rules are the same. Um, under 30,000, it's voluntary if you register for HST. Over 30,000, 
uh, you, you have to register, and what happens as soon as you uh, register for HST, number one, you're a collection agency for the government, so every time you bill, say for your engineering fees or you perform that night, it might be $1,000, at HST of 13%, $130, you owe me $1,130. So every month, once you register for HST, HST should be coming into your bank account along with your sales collection. Remember, there's no HST on royalties, just so you know about that. And so the money pours in uh, with HST, and at the same time, without even thinking about it, HST is in most of your expenses, except interest, bank charges, and some insurance, it's basically in every expense. So without even thinking about it, it's going out in your expenses. So at the end of the year, the fact that the government, that you've registered for HST, it's like the government handing you a 13% rebate coupon on all your expenses. And so at the end of the year, it's very simple. You know, what I'm describing is every month HST is sort of coming into your account if you're, if you're making money, and it's going out in your expenses. So you're sort of being reimbursed in your cash flow. But at the end of the year, it's very simple. The HST return is like this. You're telling the government, here's how much HST we collected for you, Mr. Government. And the next line is where you subtract or pay yourself back for all the HST that's in your expenses. And then what's left, you send off to the government. When that check clears, it's like HST doesn't exist. There's not one dollar in your bank account. And if you did pay $113 for something, you've just been paid back the $13 in your expenses and the $100. Now this works so well that if it's just the startup of a business or you had a lousy year, you picture maybe the expenses are more than the income. So on that HST return, we show the government, here's HST collected maybe $50, but HST paid out is $100. Well, 50 minus the 100 is negative 50. The government writes you a check back, that's a refund. So you get to keep the first 50 that you did collect. The government's gonna send you 50. Now you got the $100 back that you showed them that you spent in the HST. So um, everyone, when you make thirty thousand uh, lower or higher than thirty thousand dollars, a good account will recommend you should be registered for HST. And then here's where you have for the HST system. Now HST uh, used to be uh, the just the GST five percent and the eight percent PST was a sunk cost. And what the government and you get back in the system that I'm going to describe, you used to get back the five percent. These days now, and a number of years ago, they harmonized the 5% GST and the 8% PST, and now it's 13%, and you get the whole thing back, and here's how. Uh, in any kind of a mus uh, business, uh, under 30,000 of sales, whether it's a corporation, a partnership, or a self-employed business, these rules are the same. Uh, under 30,000, it's voluntary if you register for HST. Over 30,000, uh, you, you have to register, and what happens as soon as you uh, register for HST, number one, you're a collection agency for the government, so every time you bill, say for your engineering fees or you perform that night, it might be $1,000 at HST of 13%, $130, you owe me $1,130. So every month, once you register for HST, HST should be coming into your bank account along with your sales collection. Remember, there's no HST on royalties, just so you know about that. And so the money pours in uh, with HST, and at the same time, without even thinking about it, HST is in most of your expenses, except interest, bank charges, and some insurance, it's basically in every expense. So without even thinking about it, it's going out in your expenses. So at the end of the year, the fact that the government, that you've registered for HST, it's like the government handing you a 13% rebate coupon on all your expenses. And so at the end of the year, it's very simple. You know, what I'm describing is every month HST is sort of coming into your account if you're, if you're making money, and it's going out in your expenses. So you're sort of being reimbursed in your cash flow, but at the end of the year, it's very simple. The HST return is like this. You're telling the government, here's how much HST we collected for you, Mr. Government, and the next line is where you subtract or pay yourself back for all the HST that's in your expenses, and then what's left, you send off to the government. When that check clears, it's like HST doesn't exist. There's not one dollar in your bank account, and if you did pay $113 for something, you've just been paid back the $13 in your expenses and the $100. Now this works so well that if it's just the startup of a business or you had a lousy year, you picture maybe the expenses are more than the income. So on that HST return, we show the government, here's HST collected maybe $50, but HST paid out is $100. Well, 50 minus the 100 is negative 50. The government writes you a check back, that's a refund. So you get to keep the first 50 that you did collect. The government's gonna send you 50. Now you got the $100 back that you showed them that you spent in the HST. So um, everyone, when you make 30000 uh, lower or higher than $30,000, a good account will recommend you should be registered for HST. And then here's what you have to do. Just operate like I just said. You keep track of your income, and we know that unless it's royalties or U.S. income, typically there's 13% collected on that. 
you keep track of all your expenses, whether it's that simplest business model of just saving receipts or you actually have a business bank account. And at the end of the year, when the bookkeeping happens, we know your income and your expenses, and we know how much HST was collected and how much was paid out. And so based on our, our, our fees, which are lower than typical downtown Toronto accountant, we don't even charge for the HST return. We do the tax return, and we've done the, the bookkeeping, the summaries, we have these numbers, and we just whip off the, the HST return. So everybody should be registered for the, HS, for the HST system, no matter what small business you're in, because it, it's like, it's, it's a 13% rebate. People would drive across the city to save $5 on a case of paper. Uh, buy an Apple computer, there's two or $300 that you're getting back. Um, so, so HST is very important to be part of it, and if you're not part of it, it's a simple phone call, performance, and typically radio play. So the government years ago made an agreement with the radio stations and SOCAN that 2% or some percentage of the advertising revenues from radio stations is going to go to SOCAN. And a radio station is there for one purpose, to sell advertising, uh, in between advertising, they'll play music or do talk radio, but that's their business selling advertising, and they make millions and millions a year make doing, doing the advertising sales. So that's why a percentage of all the radio stations advertising goes to SOCAN with HST. SOCAN sends the HST to the government and sends that songwriter their money. So a pure songwriter should definitely be registered for HST because HST is taking care of them. They, they don't collect one dollar of it. It's taken care of by SOCAN. So when they have uh, you know royalties of a hundred thousand dollars, HST is taken care of. They're going to do an HST return. It'll be SOCAN royalties. So like I said before, royalties. There's not going to be any HST shown, and but there's going to be expenses claimed, obviously, and therefore it's a refund. So um, that's another. It's uh, you know, like in the old days. You got a tour and perform. If you're just a songwriter, you push the film, TV, commercials, other acts that don't um, that don't write. So we have clients that have written for Anne Murray, Celine Dion, and there's a, there, you can make a living that way as a songwriter. Um, and but you gotta it, touring is the big deal. If you have a music act, that's how you're going to make your money because music's almost free these days. So you got to build your fan base one at a time, keeping in touch with them, the emails about you know where you're going and help them design your next record co co album cover that kind of thing and um, when you you have a really good performance included in your show that that's really great yes you might have the music perfect but now you have to make a show so they want to send their friends the next night or the next time they're there in town you, you want to see that show like uh, walk off the earth is a, is a music act that does just an amazing show for you um, so uh, the idea is to tour and perform build that fan one at a time and as uh, and they're, they're, they uh, are your new fans, they want a trophy from their new favorite act. They'll buy a CD or something or a merchandise and they'll tell their friend about it. So the idea is to tour as much as possible, building that fan base. And if you're lucky, like when I get new clients in the office and it's a music act, uh, basically I explain to them for an hour how to make money in the music business these days because the digital age changed a few things. And um, I, I, let, I tell them, if you're not going to listen to me, uh, you might not make, make a living at all, but if you listen to me, guess what? The cream will rise to the top. I try to be a little positive. The cream will rise to the top. If you're really, really good, guess what? You'll be able to make a living in music. There's no more Shania Twain's or Alanis Morissette's selling millions of records. That ain't happening anymore. You've got to tour and perform, build those fans up, and hope to hopefully sell, sell from stage, sell from your website, and then, of course, you, you don't ignore all the digital ways to distribute the, the music. So I want to see if I covered off a lot of this. Where the future of retail essentially for jazz artists and, um, and quality. And, and quality. Uh, so it sounds like with HMB going down, it sounds like the Canadian market is about to resemble the US market, where I, the exact numbers vary, but there are only essentially two outlets for people to buy in all the US. The two, my two accounts that I have to worry about are Amazon, which is the bulk probably about 80% of physical sales, uh, and a company called Alliance, or AEC, based in Florida, and they supply uh, Barnes & Noble, and they supply, uh, they supply many of the smaller stores. So if you're a small store, you go to AEC, and you buy our records. We don't have, our distributor does not have a direct uh, account with, uh, with the smaller stores. So that's it. <laughs> and then artists sell at gigs. So, all you have to worry about 
I'm not sure here there, there are rack joggers like ABC in Canada, but really Amazon, at least in the US, is the only place you have to concern yourself with. Um, on the digital side, it's even more stark. It's iTunes. It's 90% of the digital business, or my digital business, and I'm sure that's pretty much industry-wide. Obviously, streaming now is uh, growing. It's growing in other genres faster than it is in jazz. Jazz hasn't, the jazz listeners, strangely to me a little bit, because jazz, jazz listeners have always been early adopters of technology, CDs, Jazz exploded before everything else on, on CD. Um, digital downloads, it was not too bad, but I think it's a quality issue like you're bringing up. Um, and now with streaming, where the quality is even lower, jazz listeners have been slower to take on streaming. There is HD streaming that's coming up. That's not really up and running in any way yet. And things like HD tracks, um, it's still a pretty small market. Now, as a label, uh, when we do a master, when, I prepare ma when our artists prepare masters, we do a CD master. We do, uh, iTunes has a format called Mastered for iTunes, which is higher quality than standard. And you also, it says, if you look on the little box, so you look at the, at the album, it says Mastered for iTunes on the little box they do. And we do an HD master. Sometimes the HD master and the Mastered for iTunes master are actually the same, depending on how the album was recorded. Um, so we're preparing three masters now for every release. Hopefully, I don't know that the market for HD downloads is going to grow that much. Um, the download market is dropping for the first time ever. Downloads dropped last year. Um, but I think HD streaming, if that, however that works out, is the future of high-res audio. The, the question's about artist share and Maria Schneider and, and the number of artists that have worked. Unfortunately, I don't know their business model. Yeah. Um, but that idea is, um, a lot of people are using that idea, and basically Maria's taken over, she's responsible for most everything in her career. Right. She's very active with her fan base, and that's, that's a key point. So a lot of people have done this, she's done it very successfully with Artist Share. Um, and people find, I was talking with Robbie before about uh, the new, funding models in a way. It used to be that if you came to a record company and you got signed, the record company would pay for the recording session, they would own the master, and they would release the record and pay for the marketing and the PR and whatever else gets done. Deals have changed a lot as it's gotten easier and cheaper for artists to record, uh, they're doing that themselves. And then licensing, and if, if there's any if people don't understand what some of the terms are, please feel free to ask me, so that the artist maintains ownership of the master that they created. They license it to a record company for a number of years and possibly for a territory or the world. And then it reverts to them or you can extend it. So more and more artists are owning their own masters, um, which is valuable, and finding ways to fund it. So artist share is one way. Um, a lot of people, and I'm sure some of you have tried crowdfunding, um, there are, in here there's Canada Council, in the US there are foundations, and even angel investors. I mean, we're really going back to, um, I forget what it's called, when King's Courts and uh, patronage. patronage, thank you. Uh, where we, many of the artists we work with and things that are going on have uh, investors, sometimes many small investors, sometimes few larger investors who want to be involved in music want to love the musician and their work, and want to be involved in the music business. They might be financiers, they might be in other areas, and or they, a lot of them are musicians or were musicians and want to stay involved. So we see kind of all different um, formulations going on in how to fund recording, how to get it made. The one thing that's become very clear, just even over the last three or four years, is that it is very, very important to engage with your audience. That's when I, I have, uh, in our marketing department, I have several younger people working uh, with us, people in their mid-20s, and when we would, when uh, someone, an artist would come up for consideration, the first thing they would do would be run to Facebook and see how many likes they have. And I, initially, I hated that. It's like, I, you know, I, I wanna hear what they do, I wanna, over time, 
I, I understand what they were doing. They wanted, they wanted to hear the music first. But to have a built-in audience that you can speak to, because it's so hard to reach people otherwise. The, the, you know, I don't know if there's a, a jazz writer here, but the media, other than the radio station, really doesn't exist. The New York Times, just their jazz writer, Nate Shannon. Yeah, um, two, they had two of the great jazz writers there. Uh, um, ben, I believe his name will come, and Nate Shannon, both who've left the New York Times in the last year. And they have people covering jazz, but in a very different way. There are no reviews of shows. So having your own audience and being able to reach those people is very important to let them know about your shows, let them know about your recordings, to sell to them directly. And over those three or four years, uh, it's, I'm now running to Facebook too. I'm not going to underestimate the importance of the music because if that's, that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to the music. And if, it doesn't, if I'm not interested in it or I don't think um, it's going to work for us, conversation stops there. That might not be the end of the conversation in all genres and it might not be the end of the conversation in all uh, labels. But for us, and we have the luxury of doing this, if it doesn't cut that first. After that, I mean, I think I would go to what kind of social media, I mean, if there's something else, if we really believe uh, in, the, in the music and we think there's a career, right now we're, we're really focusing on building artist careers. That's, I think, the only way to a, a label can survive these days. So we don't, want, we, while we still might do an interesting all-star project that's a one-off, um, we really want to work with artists who are building a career. And so we can't afford, because building a career from scratch uh, is expensive and does not pay off immediately. So if you have someone that you really think can build a career, we're going to be making an investment and it's not gonna, we're not going to earn that back on the first record. We're going to earn it back on second, third, however many records. So we're looking to see if this is someone um, who can build a long-term career and that we can partner with to help build their career. Are they out there performing? Um, what is their, how are they doing on social media? Are they hustling? Do they get themselves known? What the other, what's their standing in the jazz community, if that's important, if it's, if it relies, if their career is going to rely on that. So, um, the music is by far the most important thing to start, and then all these things factor into varying degrees um, after that. The question is how, uh, how do we find new artists? Um, all, of, all of the above. Um, we are based in New York. It's still a very good place to get heard and seen. Uh, so yes, we, we, have, we go out to the clubs. A lot of times, uh, artists we work with recommend people. It's artists um, in bands that we work with. And sometimes things come out of the blue. Uh, Joey Alexander, uh, I was sent a YouTube video from when he was 11 years old. Um, that was an unusual case, and it rarely happens like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really comes in. It's rarely a cold call. There's usually so much stuff comes in to every label. Uh, that we rely on essentially gatekeepers of a certain kind, whether it's an artist manager, uh, a lawyer working with an artist, other artists, then we're more likely to, to listen. It's also usually someone we've seen or, you know, we're, we're starting, we're not working with many uh, brand new artists to start with, Joey obviously. So is the business has <laughs> shrunk by about 85 or 90 percent. It's not scientific, but that's, I would expect back then if I had a Joey Alexander record, I'd expect to be at about 500, 600,000 records. It would be a gold record. So it's very, very different. And so what's selling, you need a story. And it doesn't have to be that you're an 11 year old Indonesian boy, but the project needs a story you need. People, is, more and more, are latching on to a story. So whatever that, whatever that story is that can grab people's interest, the story of the music, the story of the artist, the story of the band. Um, Donnie McCaslin's record, Donnie's band had just performed on David Bowie's last record, Black Star. Um, Donnie's band has been doing what they do for a number of years, but an obvious, hook for us in this 
is that this was David Bowie's last band. And the band played on the album. There's two Bowie songs live. They play one a night. It's not a David Bowie band. It's really a Donnie. David Bowie took Donnie McGaslin's sound for his album. But that was an important story to at least get people interested and get them to hear, because we need people to hear the music. It's so easy now. When I first got into jazz, I used to keep literal a list, a literal list of records that I needed to find. It was like sheets of paper, and I'd go into record stores, and I'd try and cross them off. I can find anything I want online instantly now, which is great. You know, jazz right now is probably 2% of the market, depending on where you are. My line has always been, that's great. We have 90% of the people to introduce to the music. And now it's much easier. You know, I, some of you probably remember when you were getting into jazz, you had to go either to the scary jazz section at Sands and ask the scary <laughs> jazz guy what to listen to. And you don't have to do this. Like, yeah, you could buy that record, but it sucks. You know, that, that guy. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. Your friend can tell you, hey, you should, you should check out this thing, I Love Supreme. You might be listening to metal, and someone hears something in a Love Supreme that, you know, or interstellar space or some culture, you know. It's so it's so much easier to build a jazz audience now because people can listen. And I've always thought, if you just let people hear jazz, they're going to like it. How many, probably you've all done something where someone, you played something for someone, they go, that's jazz? But I don't like jazz and I like that. Yeah. So it's so much easier for people to get to hear that music, to hear the music now. So we need to take advantage of that. Now, how people get paid for their work, that right now is the hard part. Maybe things will change on the streaming front, maybe the volume of streaming will grow so much that it will start to pay, but we're in a very interesting time, interesting and difficult in some ways, but um, right now there's a, it's harder for people to get paid, artists, labels, whoever, for their work with, with streaming coming on. Hopefully, we're finding a way. But, yeah. Yeah. How does what kind of music So what I usually talk about when, when we talk about social media is that obviously you look at it and if you have no experience in it, you're like, where the hell am I supposed to start? Like, what am I supposed to be doing here? How does this all work out for me? And um, I start with all my clients of like, who is your audience? Who are the people that you're speaking to? Um, you know, demographics. You know, who are the people who are at your shows? Do you know, if you're not doing shows, what other artists are you actually similar or sounding like and who are their audiences? You know, we're looking at ages, we're looking at um, male versus female, we're looking at where do they live, how do they consume, what interests them, social habits, are they f uh, food and wine people, are they drinking beer, um, you know, do they watch uh, NHL hockey, or are were they watching Monday Night Football, like, or are they more at the AGO every week, you know, like, um, and then also similar artists. And what I tell people to do is really sit down and kind of figure out who your perfect consumer is. Like, if I could give you a room of say 300 people, who do you think? What? Tell me what that group would be like. And those are. It's an interesting question when you ask a, a musician that because it's like, whoa, I. I don't know, I just want people who like my music. It's like, that's true. But you know that they're not headbangers that have been listening to Metallica all day long. They could be, but, or they could be someone who's been painting or doing something else. Like you want to figure out who that person is and then that will translate into how you're going to research them for the internet and how you're going to reach them through social media. I enjoy telling artists to figure out your 15 second elevator pitch and that's a really hard thing to do, but once you get that, you know who you are and you know what your brand is and you're gonna be able to tell me. And when you're talking to art, and you know, I love, I love artists, and don't get me wrong, but when you tell me, I don't sound like anybody else, I'm special, <laughs> fantastic. That doesn't help me because special, I mean, there's a good chance that you're not gonna sell anything and no one cares because you're, they are going to like something else to you. They, you know, marketing is 
we we rip each other off all the time. Like it's kind of like if you if you sound like this, then I think you're going to do well over here. Like we need to kind of be able to put. I hate to say it, put you in a box. But your YouTube videos are so important, and tagging things that are outside of just um, uh, the most popular things. Like if you're if you're tagging like. Um, Beaver and Trisha Pal Palace and like all these kind of high-end things, you're going to not end up on this because it's going to move. However, if you are tagging things like jazz, Oscar P Peterson, food and wine, red wine, like things that kind of once met once again goes back to your demographics, you have a better chance of jumping in there. Like keywords within our the songs um, that you're doing. Within the new algorithm. Well, it's an interesting thing because with you, with Facebook, Facebook changes their API and their algorithms every you know couple of days, depending on. So, Facebook doesn't want you to leave Facebook. That's their biggest thing, right? So they're telling you like if you if you put up a, a link from YouTube onto Facebook because one of the things that you'll have a lot of people who are in the industry ask you what your Facebook numbers are and what your YouTube views are. So what happens is is that with the YouTube views, you go into you, you put your link into Facebook and you're like, okay, this is gonna be great because it's gonna give me some more, some more views and that sort of thing. It no longer puts it into, now, if it was a year and a half ago, two years ago, that is true. Now, if you actually don't load it into Facebook, it doesn't go into the, th into the threads or the streams anymore like it used to. So you don't get, it A doesn't get viewed and it doesn't actually count anymore. Does a bitly, uh, if we use a bitly shortcut, you know, does it, uh, no, the, the smart links and the short links, they, they're great for being able to get um, some metrics and some data for, and I, I encourage people to be looking at that kind of stuff. But when it comes to Facebook, face, Facebook does not want you to leave Facebook anymore, and they want you to do all of your business on Facebook. So they want you to be uploading your videos onto Facebook, and you're staying there. So one of the things that we've been doing as kind of a workaround with this, is that we're putting together like 30 second clips of videos, putting those up into you into Facebook, and then linking the YouTube in the description right there. So, I mean, like, you like this, you can then boost it or do whatever you want to on the advertising aspect to it, and then you just immediately hit the link, and that moves you over to YouTube. So it's the way of, it's kind of the get around card for now, Talk to me in six months, there's gonna be something else. <laughs> I really wish that, like, as I said earlier, um, there's no sound way of doing this, it's constantly changing. So, I would you love to. You have to keep up on, on what the changes are. And, and yeah, well, there's the, and, and you have to be, like, the fact that you, you know about the descriptions on uh, YouTube, a lot of people are not aware of it, what's going on with the YouTube stars and the monetization. So, you have to keep reading and being interested if, if you're going to be a creator. So websites like Social Media Examiner would be a good one to Yeah. Students yeah. go something like this. Put out fire, put out fire, put out client fire, and then answer the emails of the people who forgot to do something that week that I have to do it immediately. And then from like three to five o'clock, I read up on social media um, trends and what's going on. And then the other thing is, I, you know, a lot of people, when you're having a lot of questions about what you're supposed to be doing or how to upload things or doing stuff, YouTube's got some great videos on how just to do stuff. How to use their system. How to use their system. They, they've got a great step-by-step. -step. How to use Facebook, how to use Twitter. Like, you know, one of the things is you can get lost in some of that stuff. And I've picked up some great tips myself on things where I'm like, I didn't know that, you know, because it's constantly changing and there's always something going on. So thank you so much for taking Uh, a bit about the differences in the types of conferences that are out there. Um, there's a bit of a spectrum. You have um, conferences that are more, you know, focused on the performance and the showcasing. Um, you know, kind of a conference slash festivals. Um, there are some pretty industry heavy conferences that go on um, where you're doing a lot of panels and it's a lot all about uh, kind of business to business networking making those types of connections. Um, there's also performing arts conferences, um, which Derek will speak to a bit, but those are your uh, contact um, and other such uh, events where um, it's a very showcase heavy uh, 
type of event. And yeah, a little bit, maybe Derek, if you want to talk about which of those kinds of events you see as um, being the most accessible and the most valuable to jazz artists. Yeah, I see uh, a, f a fourth uh, category, because um, in the notes preparing for today, I was uh, suggesting that there are indeed in industry conferences like Canadian Music Week, North By, um, and performing arts. Uh, Rosalind mentioned the contact events, and I'll, I'll give you a tip right off the top that uh, there's uh, information shared at one of the clearinghouses for information, which is the National Performing Arts uh, Organization, Kapakoa. Uh, and at their website, there is a list, uh, as there is at, um, at Ontario Presents, of all the contact performing arts uh, meetings in Canada. Kapakoa is the Canadian Association of Performing Arts. Uh, it's based in Ottawa. Uh, you should have any trouble finding that website. It's as it sounds, all those letters. Some of them are extra because of the French. Um, and the third category I would identify are genre-specific um, uh, conferences. And the fourth, just for the sake of the fact that we're here talking about jazz, are jazz conferences, because uh, uh, there are two, uh, I don't know about a jazz conference, and in, in, this is it actually right here, um, in Canada. There, there is one in, in, uh, in Europe, uh, Jazz Head in Bremen, and in the States, Jazz Connect, which takes place in January in New York City. Um, uh, so the contact events have been uh, rather open to all, what happened about 20 years ago, I'd say, uh, there was a trend in, in the performing arts conferences where they were dominated by classical music and the audiences for classical music were starting to slide and they really opened up to popular music. So we started to see folk, jazz, blues, world music showing up in the showcase programs. These are programs that are juried. They're, they, the showcases are selected by somebody who is acting on behalf of the network. So an Ontario Contact is a network of all the performing arts presenters, and they have a meeting every October. So and they have an office in Spadina. You can go there and talk to them. Uh, but in the meantime, you can go to their website, and they, they have a, their website handle is I want to showcase. And that I want to showcase handle is now actually used by uh, Contact East, Pacific Contact, a handful of them are using that as the way in to apply for a showcase. And in my opinion, that's where there's a great opportunity for jazz artists to, uh, to break in. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention with those uh, showcases, so they happen across Canada. So if you're interested, um, you know, if you're interested in touring in Saskatchewan, the you know, Saskatchewan Contact is an excellent uh, conference. And essentially, if you're, um, if you're showcasing for these presenters, they're, ba they're like a network around those provinces. So if you get picked up by it, most likely you're getting picked up on kind of a tour around that province and in like very nice performing arts centers. So these are like soft seater, a lot of these are soft seater gigs that uh, can be really great. Um, and block booking is a term that we could introduce right now because at those meetings, uh, the presenters are sitting down and saying, Hmm, let's all put in an offer for the Shuffle Demons or Jane Bennett or Lila Bialy, wherever it is, and they coordinate a tour and they come forward with six gigs, ten gigs, whatever it is, and block booking is the dream gig because it all happens for you all at once. So let's move on. Jazz Ahead is probably the mother of all jazz conferences. It's so concentrated, everybody from all over the world in the, in the jazz world is there. So and they have uh, great showcases uh, and they're really discerning with uh, picking they've got uh, they've got uh, committees from all over the world and uh, it's pretty tough to get a showcase in, uh, a jazzy head so if you do get one consider yourself very fortunate you know. but it is where the whole jazz world goes so um, you know, as an artist, here's here's the thing. As an artist, uh, you have to really prepare carefully and know how to present yourself. Because more times than not, you know, everybody well, everybody's sitting on agents right? and presenters. So you just can't walk in there and go, hey, can you book me? You know, it's not going to fly. 
You have to contact those people. You have to develop a relationship with them. It might take two or three jazz aheads or whatever conference you're going to to develop that relationship where, you know, there's, there's trust enough where you can get a, uh, a meeting and discuss real, real business. Uh, as opposed to a label or a booking agency or a, 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 a professional group that has more than one artist. It's, there is difficulty on a one artist situation. Uh, so it, it requires a lot of time, a lot of studying, a lot of uh, research, yeah. Just deciding, you have to decide what am I after here? What do I want to get out of this? And you have to know that it's not going to happen the first year. If it does, it's the exception. It's not the norm. So, you know, think about it as a long-term uh, situation and prepare for it that way. But do prepare, find out who you want to meet, what they do, know about them. Just showing up at a booth, cold calling, it's not really going to get you too far unless you have um, some out of this world. So, is that um, all these, because the, the size of these festivals, they really you really do have to have a gatekeeper because there aren't too many people. I, I saw it as an observer. I would see people coming up and say, here's my CD. I said, big deal. You can buy CDs that, uh, well, you can't buy them anywhere now. <laughs> but you can buy them at Staples, right? The, they're, they're called blanks. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything unless you have, um, you've developed a relationship with someone who's going to get you into that thing. So we were very fortunate because so we were on all the records, so when we went to the conferences, we weren't there just like doing a cold call. We had the imprimatur of a, of a bona fide record company. Uh, so that immediately doesn't give you an advantage. It just gets you into the door so you can have the conversation. So as Peter says, you do have to develop. You have to develop your career. I mean, uh, you can't expect to, to be able to knock on the door and someone's going to, there's just too many people doing it now. The whole, the whole thing, I, 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 I do understand this idea of doing it yourself, that, that's this, it's the new democracy and stuff, but the practicalities are that something has to filter it. There has to be a filter. In Europe, I work in Italy a, a bunch, and you cannot get a gig at, unless, unless someone else is there to uh, represent you. And it doesn't matter what your name is and who you know. The, the thing is that they've actually put that, you know, that's that, that's that filter. You have to have it because there's so much. So I think before you're you talking go about, um, yeah, the preparation of what you can do. I've heard from a lot of artists that will come back from one of these big conferences and, you know, say, well, I invested, you know, it's hundreds to thousands of dollars in travel and registration. Um, and then say, well, I didn't get any gigs out of it, so it wasn't a good conference, you know, I wouldn't go back. And, you know, I think a lot of times there are different uh, valuable things that you can get out of a conference that's not just gigs. And also, um, you know, the chances that you're going to go to a conference and someone's going to hand you a contract for their festival at that conference are pretty slim. Um, I recently got a gig for a festival this summer for um, a conference from someone that I met three years ago, you know, and she said, oh, I remember seeing your showcase in this hotel, and I thought it was great, it wasn't the right time, but I remembered you, and, you know, would you like to do it this year? That's three years later. I probably, at the time, was like, nah, I didn't get the gig. Um, so there are, you know, there are returns that you can see uh, from your investment. Some of them are more immediate, and some of them are more long-term. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what those kinds of returns can be. What I usually see is, um, you know, sometimes people will say they make, uh, they meet a lot of musicians. So as an artist, you go there, you're kind of hanging out with musicians. Musicians are attending your showcase, but they're not seeing necessarily the presenters or the agents possibly at their showcase. Um, or maybe that's just kind of who they're networking with uh, because they don't have representation. Um, having an artist come and see you and really like you um, and maintaining that contact can also be incredibly valuable because that artist might 
go on to do whatever they're doing and might think of you to you know do a tour with or you know there's all sorts of great things that can come from also networking with your peers and developing relationships with your peers um, when is market ready this is the language of the music industry that speaks to and at the f when you're applying for a factor grant to go to a showcase you have to check a whole lot of boxes to be determined as market ready having a team having a release in the market uh, conference producers like myself uh, at Mundial and Blue Summit we have to we look at the factor criteria because factor is tired of supporting showcases uh, for artists that are not market ready, they come to a showcase and they're not prepared. Uh, that's not if I am approached by a person in advance of a conference uh, with uh, certain things, and there are certain things I don't want. I don't want a lot of heavy uh, downloads or uh, attachments. I simply reject those. I, I want maybe SoundCloud or links that are easy for my computer to take because my computer is groaning with the amount of information that it has to, uh, to take. So I want simple things and links only, uh, video links in particular. I want to see YouTube, I want to see live YouTube. Our application at Mundial um, has a list of things that you are required to provide and at the top is live video. And, and if you don't have that and you don't have good live video of your performance, um, you're really not going to go past uh, a certain point. It's not going to help me make an evaluation of whether or not your live show is what I need for, uh, for the selection process. Um, uh, I, I do actually support the idea of going to a conference to do research. That word came up a moment ago. And I've seen it happen where people have gone to certain conferences just to get the lay of the land. They've gone to New York and APAP and just hung out in the bar or wherever and met people. And, and uh, I don't know if you can afford, I mean, it's a, it's a great investment. If you're going to take a vacation in Europe, go, and, go in the springtime to Germany and have some white asparagus um, and, and hang out at Bremen. Um, I've seen people do that. Amanda Martinez went to Womex and she, she didn't have a showcase. She just went and she met people and then she got a better education. And, and then ask which is Jazz Festivals Canada. Uh, in Canada, the, there is a network of jazz festivals who meet and plan. They don't have a conference, but um, they will get together this October. They get together several times a year. You can find all their contact information at uh, jazzfestivalscanada.ca. I think there's 19 or 20 members. It includes Toronto Jazz, Montreal, Vancouver, Victoria, all the national jazz festivals are there, and, and they have a process uh, going forward. That if you can get an appointment with, with uh, Josh Grossman from, from Toronto Jazz, if Josh was sitting here right beside me, I'm sure he would say, you know, I'll have a coffee with you. Talk to me about um, your project. They have tried to open up to the Toronto Jazz community, and Josh makes himself available like I do. I take, I had a, I had a breakfast meeting yesterday with a Persian centro player, a guy who whose music I like, and he's got a CD coming out, and uh, I just gave him some free advice, pro bono, to helping him try to figure out his process. So a lot of us in the field make our, make ourselves available to coach you. We're here together today to talk about it in en masse, but one on one, and that personal contact is is big. just talking about showcasing, I'll, I'll talk about our uh, showcase uh, project uh, component. Um, so our showcase funding, it is, it's a subsidy to uh, uh, assist with travel costs for attending showcases. So things like Jazz Head, Mayhap, um, Mina, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, so I think something uh, that's important to remember is that it's not intended we know how expensive it is to attend these things. It's not going to cover all of your expenses, but it will hopefully uh, help. Um, so to be eligible, oh, <laughs> uh, to be eligible for for that, um, so first of all, you need to uh, be signed up in our online system, and uh, for the showcase program, you need to have a full-length release that was either released within the past two years or will be released in the upcoming six months. 
And for us, a full length is it's at least six tracks or 20 minutes of runtime. So, um, you know, some people say, oh, it's an EP, but if it meets the length requirements, that's fine. Um, and um, yeah, I'd say that's that's the program. Uh, you know, I'd really recommend because it is one where if you meet the basic eligibility, uh, you're very likely to receive funding for that. Um, and something new for um, for this year, uh, we've received extra funding to go towards international showcasing. So um, every fiscal year, you can get up to five thousand dollars in showcase applications, um, and then we are now offering an additional twenty five hundred for international. So you can get a little more with that. Um, and then our other two most popular programs are. Are juried programs. So one is the artist development uh, grant, and the other is the juried sound recording uh, program. So the the artist development grant is um, it's a two thousand dollar grant, and we designed it to be as flexible as possible. So you can use it for sound recording. You can use it for marketing initiatives. So if you want to make um, video content, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, for that, uh, you would uh, submit an application to, uh, to go through our juries, and, um, so, um, and then just quickly, the other um, program I was going to mention is Straight Sound Recording. Uh, that's for funding a full-length album and the marketing around that. So for that, um, it's a larger grant, it's $25,000. Um, it's much more competitive than the arts development, um, and for that application, you also include a, a detailed marketing plan. Um, so the Ontario Music Office is housed at the Ontario Media Development Corporation. There's so many acronyms there. Uh, so the OMDC, and what the OMDC does is provide um, basically financial support um, for Ontario's creative industry. So that's more than just music, it's film, television, interactive digital media, books and magazines. So that's where uh, we come from. The Ontario Music Fund specifically is an economic development fund for um, the music industry in Ontario. And what we do is we focus on the entire ecosystem. So we're not designed necessarily um, as a direct artist support, although we do support artists. Um, but uh, what we try to do is serve the entire ecosystem. Um, so the fund itself is split into four separate streams. There's the music company development, um, live music, music industry development, and music futures. Um, we would support record labels, music managers, music publishers, um, artist entrepreneurs, and by artist entrepreneurs we mean artists who are uh, truly in control of their own career and make their own uh, decisions and um, financial undertakings are, are belong to the artist and not to a label or manager. Um, in terms of, of um, live music, we would support uh, music festivals, obviously, uh, promoters, presenters, and booking agents. Uh, the music industry development stream, um, to speak to some of the points on the previous panel, um, supports trade organizations. For example, the uh, Ontario Music Fund at the OMDC uh, provides some support for this event, um, and we provide support for similar events uh, through the music industry development stream. And Music Futures in, uh, encompasses uh, several of uh, same types of companies I've mentioned earlier, but at a smaller scale. Um, the one thing that we stress is the economic development uh, fund. So instead of being um, sort of a, a startup fund necessarily, the idea behind the OMF is to take um, companies and artists who are already established or on their way to being established, and we try to take them to the next level. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Star Maker, we are not dissimilar to that. Um, and because of that, we, there is a um, financial requirement in order to apply for funding, which you must be um, earning $30,000 to apply to the fund as a company, um, and then we can help 
take it from there. So for those of you who may be starting out or who are not ready to apply, I enjoy having these discussions because I can tell you um, the things that you can look forward to in your future, or ways in which you can engage in our funding indirectly. Um, again, speaking to the previous panel, I, I can't stress the importance of engaging in your local organizations um, and trade, trade associations that can help you indirectly uh, with support like uh, panels like this, uh, with Music Canada as well, and uh, uh, we help support some of their uh, programming. <coughs> I have applied to Ontario Arts and Toronto Arts and Canada Council, uh, and I received funding uh, for all three of those applications. Uh, which is um, awesome. Yes. <laughs> and that's because I made sure that everything was on point. I made sure that I had my budget together down to the penny. Uh, I made sure that the music was on point, uh, and, and my proposal was worded in a way that really made sense to uh, the potential jurors. Um, Megan, can you speak to the uh, Ontario Arts Council and how it differs from uh, Factor? Yeah, so I think um, Rich touched on something really important is uh, tailoring your application to the funder. So Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, they're arts councils. Uh, so when they're assessing applications, um, you know, they're looking at the, their main focus is the music for the artistry, music for music's sake. Uh, Factor, we are we're a public-private partnership, so we're uh, funded in part by the government of Canada and, and in part by uh, public, uh, sorry, private radio broadcasters. Um, so for us, in our assessment, uh, there's more of a focus about um, about the more of the business side and basically demonstrating that you know who your audience is and you have a, a, an, a plan that you can reasonably execute to reach that audience. Um, and that's not to say that everyone who applies to Factor and gets Factor funding, you know, that it's all, you know, people that you hear on the radio or that kind of thing. But it, it is about um, really understanding your, your audience. Um, and your plans for executing that. So, um, so while obviously for our jury programs, uh, you have to submit an assessment check, like a, a demo. Um, you know, the music is very important, but um, for us, we're also looking at your plan for how you're going to get it out into the world. And I, I really wanted to encourage you all to think about is becoming a juror for our factor programs. So, if you have at least five years of experience in the industry as an artist or other industry experience, um, you can apply to be a juror and um, assess applications for the program. And I think that is, it can be really useful because you can you can see other examples of, of applications. Um, and also you're, you're doing a service to your community because you're, you're telling you're telling us this is good. This is we should fund this. Um, I don't know. Have you had good experiences being uh, a juror for? You said you you were a juror for some arts councils. That was going to be my next question. Yes. <laughs> do you find it useful in that way? Or? I do find it very useful, and it's it's good um, because the juries. I've served on a bunch of juries. I've done some for the Canada Council, the Toronto Arts, and Ontario Arts, and. Um, the juries are always very diverse, and it's not always just musicians. It's definitely not just jazz musicians or just you know uh, musicians of a particular genre. Uh, so it's good to get those different perspectives, and um, uh, also it's important because there are different genres that come up in each of the the juries, and not all the music is going to be understood by all of the jurors. So sometimes if you get like an avant-garde artist submitting some music and um, you know maybe a couple of the jurors just don't like it, then it might be up to um, juries on the panel who are more familiar with that genre to convince them as to why this is a viable uh, project to fund. Um, so I can say with, uh, with factor juries, um, we 
we do organize our um, our jurors by genre, so you will only have um, artists, industry members, uh, jurors who are um, who are familiar with, with with jazz and work in jazz, assessing your application. So um, one thing I would say is to be very clear about whether you have. So if you're if you're talking about the team and people you want to work with, be very clear about whether you have you actually have an agreement with someone and someone you would like to work with. Because uh, we've had cases where you know they'll say, oh, I'm going to work with this person, and that person happens to be on the jury, and they say, I've never talked to this person, right? So um, <laughs> being uh, being very clear and honest about that. Um, I think for for any funder, always proofread and um, yeah, especially uh, if you uh, if you have hired a grant writer or or a friend to to write your application, um, again, just uh, <laughs> make sure you take a look at that. Um, and yeah, I mean, definitely for us, it is about being realistic and specific with your with your goals. Um, I would say. You know, don't uh, make a, a big claim just because you think it'll sound good and impressive. Um, you know, it should be something that you can actually do, and and it makes sense for you at the level that you're at. Um, and and yeah, and also, I mean, just leaving enough time uh, to apply. So. For our jury programs, we have deadlines, but you don't have to wait until three hours before the deadline to apply. Um, <laughs> uh, people who have applied to Factor uh, may be familiar with how slow our system can be on a deadline day. Um, so really recommend leaving yourself enough time and also time so that you can talk to your project coordinator. Um, I think the uh, I think sometimes people are hesitant to use their project coordinator as a resource. Um, I know when I was in that role, I'd get phone calls from people saying, oh, I'm so sorry to call and ask you questions. And I'm like, that's my job. <laughs> you know? um, and they can, you know, if you have questions like, oh, I, I don't know if I should apply to artist development or juried sound recording. You know, they can, they can talk to you and, and advise. So uh, leaving time to, to have those conversations. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you.